Last time I asked you about uh, how you're surviving, basically how you're getting your food. And um, you talked a bit about going for alms and how that's an appropriate way for a monk to deliver message of Buddhism to potentially people who have never heard of Buddhism and don't know anything about it. I want to expand a little bit more on that and ask you more about your lifestyle because it's unique within the monastic community that I'm aware of. Not only are you going for alms, interacting with people who didn't specifically come there to offer you anything, but you're also not accepting money. I know there are a few, there are some rules in the Buddhist monastic discipline regarding gold and silver, which is usually interpreted as money. Um, yes. But today, regardless of that disciplinary code, most monks, to my knowledge, still use money, handle money. They use credit cards, um, cash. And there's different explanations that I've heard for why they do it. Uh, my question to you is why you don't. Obviously, it's not um, the time of the Buddha anymore, and we're not using gold and silver. Um, most people don't even use cash, but... Right, right, right. So, I don't know. For me, the, the idea of being a monk was not using money. Um, and I think that um, some people are surprised when I tell people that most monks use money. And in our last interview, I, I'd spoken about how I would go for alms. And I would say that one of the things I would say to sort of calm people down and uh, get people interested in what I'm doing is to tell people that I haven't touched money in 18 years. And then automatically, if they're if they're angry at me for being weird or in front of their house, all that sort of just calms down just a little bit when I say I'm not looking for money. And um, I mean, you would, you would be super psyched if you, if you saw a beggar and he says, you know, on the street and he says, I'm not looking for money, I'm just, I'm just looking for some food. And you have to, you have to give him food. <laughs> and um, but like, you know, if you have another beggar, he says, I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I'm doing a spiritual endeavors and I don't touch money and I'm just looking for food, you know, then, then it becomes more interesting and someone becomes more open to um, hearing about the teachings. And so afterwards I give a blessing and I explain a little bit about cause and effect. And it's, a, it's an essential teaching. And I also tell people that um, what comes around goes around and they should do things with loving kindness because that will come back to them. And I can give this essential teaching. And if you touch money, you, you can't do that. If you cook for yourself, if you touch money, you, become, you don't become dependent on the lay people. And the Buddha created uh, several rules to make you dependent on lay people. First was, he said that you shouldn't touch money. The second thing he said was that you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't store food and you should have food that's offered. So no matter how much food I get, I can't save it and hoard it for the next day. Um, so just, just a few days ago, uh, just yesterday, I gave away um, a, re uh, sorry, uh, an extra Rice Krispie treat that I happened to have because I couldn't, eat, I couldn't eat it all. So they gave me two Rice Krispie treats and they gave me two M&M packets <laughs> and, uh, and like a burrito thing. And then I had some other things and some other things and some other things. And I, I, couldn't, eat, I couldn't eat all of that. It's, it's, um, it just wasn't possible. So I, I, I gave... I have to give it away at the very end. And as much as I would love to save it for the next day, I have to give it away and then, or throw it out or feed the birds or whatever. And then uh, the next day I have to do the same thing all over again. And so we're always dependent 
on the lay people for our livelihood. And when we're at the monasteries, you know, it's, um, it's a different ball game. And like in Myanmar, we get food delivered to us every day. And people will eventually start complaining about the food. Oh, it doesn't have this, it's too oily, it doesn't have this nutrition, doesn't have that nutrition. And, uh, and people will be complaining about food that's still given by lay people, but it's more in institutionalized. And then it becomes sort of expected. And uh, so anyways, uh, when we, when we don't uh, touch money, store food, and only accept food that's offered to us, we, we open ourselves up to be able to give the teachings to other people. And we're also very grateful for the food we get. And uh, there's also a check and balance system. So that if we, do, if we do something wrong, people will talk and the donors will disappear. And then we either you know, we, we, we won't get food, so we have to leave or whatever. So um, I think that the, the Buddhist rules are still valid today, just as they were 2,600 years ago. And as I'm going to, new, uh, to a new culture that doesn't support Buddhism, I can definitely see that following the rules is essential to the spread of Buddhism. And that's how Buddhism spread to Thailand or Myanmar, where, where, the, um, where the Pindapata tradition, the going for alms tradition is, is, is super easy. You walk down the street, you don't have to wait, and people eventually are waiting for you to give food. At one time, you know, it, it didn't accept uh, the uh, mendicant monk culture, and someone had to start somehow. And, uh, and get them interested. And now there's, sometimes there's a lady who waits for me and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really nice the way things happen. And uh, I have this one family, they, they come out with their little kid and they, they uh, serve me together as a family, just like they would in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, Thailand. And uh, so it's, um, it's very nice, but if you if you use money, if you use money, it's sort of pointless to go out and collect food. It it's it's like cheating. It's like um, it, it's like cheating. It's not it's not fair. It's like tricking. It's like tricking people into giving you, you know, to giving you food so you can save your money. Where normally you would just buy your own food, and that's what happens. Actually, the monks buy their food. They cook for themselves. And, uh, and, and so this is a rule that's still in effect today, but it's ignored um, out of convenience. So it seems whenever I would tell somebody that monks don't use money or that I didn't use money when I was a monk and right. you, give all, you give up your belongings and things like that, then the question is always, well, and how do you survive and all this stuff, which some of which is you just explained. I sense that a lot of people have some suspicion that there's some sort of like hidden information that you're not disclosing, like we're working on the side or like if we're not getting money, we must be, you must be doing something else. Like basically there's this idea in, at least in the Western culture that everything is like a give and take it's a trade so like if you're not if someone's giving you money you're giving someone else something back some other right. way and um there's always a suspicion well you know what is the give and take here and um even even outside of the context of using money or not using money um people ask regarding the monastic lifestyle i i've heard this so many times they just say um so the lay people are just supposed to support you and you get to meditate all the time like what is the 
relationship here? What is the, <laughs> I mean, obviously it seems to make sense that if you're just living life of relaxation, I mean, I'm not saying that you are and, you know, meditating to purify yourself and then it makes sense. Okay. Maybe you should just give up money and lessen the burden on the lay people. But can you say something now about, okay, well, the lay people do need to offer you support because that is the interdependent relationship that you just mentioned where monks have to depend on the lay people. Um, well, if that interdependency exists, what are monks given back? My, my, my understanding is that you're not like obligated to give blessings, for example, like m lay people sh shouldn't be going out there to like ask blessings. Hey, I'll give you some food. Give me a blessing. Right. That shouldn't be the attitude either. Well, the, um, when I give a blessing, I usually, I usually tell people they make their own blessing. So when they give, when they do something out of loving kindness, they get that back. And so it's, um, So they, when I give the blessing, I'm not really doing something for them. I'm just telling them what they did, actually. And when I lived at this one place, uh, it was called, um, the, the person we call him Uncle Gene, let's say. And uh, he, he sort of, he's a Buddhist. He's part of a Japanese Buddhist. Uh, it's called SGI, Sogo Kai or so, Soka Kai or something like that. And... Uh, He's sort of Bud he he's he's Buddhist according to the this Japanese tradition. It's a lay a lay person tradition, and um, he's he was he was open to try something out. Okay, and and I told him that I don't do exchanges to live at his place, and I needed a place to stay, and uh, and the timing was just right. I was leaving another place, and. Um, And I told him, I, I don't do any exchange. I don't, I don't do exchanges for staying at your place. I might do things out of love, you know, uh, to, to help out around here, but I don't, I don't have a, a work requirement and I, I can't do that. But I can do things to help out, you know, and as a, and you can, you know, and he could ask me to do things and I would help. Um, And what I would do is I would go for alms all the time and he would see how long I'm gone for. And, uh, and I would come back and I'd tell him about my adventures and this and that. And I would, uh, um, and he would be um, really inspired. And then I would tell him, you know, you're letting me live on your property and you're a cause for all this good that I'm, I'm doing. And slowly, uh, but surely, he would realize uh, that it was, it was a gain for him to let me live on his property, rather than uh, having some type of, you know, ex exchange go take place. And um, so it was, it was really good. And he would come to the meditation talks. So I would have a guided meditation that I would do in, um, in, in Princeville and people would, people would come to that. He would come to that. Um, and uh, recently I just changed the format to a, a lecture um, where I teach people about Buddhism and everything's free. The, the place is paid for by one donor who understands the whole uh, idea of merit and She pays for the place and we don't have a basket. We don't accept donations, you know, money donations or anything like that. And uh, I used to teach in the morning and sometimes people would bring food. Uh, but, uh, but that's, that's all I'll take. And uh, so um, there's merit to be gained. And it's difficult to teach Westerners about giving and having the idea of getting that good karma back they they don't like that they think they should just give for the sake of giving and be selfless about about giving but uh 
it's better actually from a Buddhist perspective if you pay attention to cause and effect when you give. So when I give the blessing, I try to explain about how cause and effect works. And, uh, and I explain basically in short, you know, the, the Western meme, what, what comes around goes around. And uh, so always do everything with loving kindness. And sometimes someone, someone will give me a ride and, and I say, do you want a blessing? They say, I don't, have, I, don't have, uh, I don't have enough time, I'm late. And I say, what comes around goes around. You make your own blessings. And I shut the door and they're like, right on. And, and that's all I really need to say anyways, because that's all the blessing, that's all uh, what the blessing is about. Wait, I just got confused. Sometimes people open the door and they shut the door. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting, I get a ride from someone. Okay. And then, uh, because when I was living at the, at uncle Gene's place, I had to get a, um, I had to get a ride because it was like three miles. It was three miles uh, down the road. No, I'm sorry. It was like five miles down the road. So you couldn't, you couldn't walk uh, to where, to the village. So um, they would drop me off at, at, you know, the, the drop off place. Okay. Usually like the bus stop or where the shell station is. And, uh, and as they drop me off, I say, Hey, can I give you a small blessing? And 80%, 90% say yes. Okay. But there's 10% that say, nah, I'm late. I got to go. And I just, you know, as I'm, as I'm leaving, I say, what comes around goes around. I and see. Blessings. And then they're like, right on. They give you the little, the little shaka sign. And, uh, <laughs> And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then they go, and so, they zoom. Out. So when you say you give them a blessing, what you what you mean is you give them. You say like some words in Pali, and then you do a translation, or are you saying that the blessing is their own actions? are having like a cause and effect are you actually what is the blessing that you are giving just by being there or what yeah well traditionally the um especially in thailand they say they say a little uh, a little phrase okay and then the last the last line says chataro dhamma ayu wano sukam balang so i translate that last line cuz i can't translate the whole thing cuz i have to be sort of quick. I don't want to take up everyone's time. So I tell people that there are four dhammas, chattaro dhamma. Chattaro means four. Dhamma means qualities. And I tell them it's the same word as dharma, which is the word they've heard before. Uh, but in this case, it means qualities instead of the teaching. And um, ayu is long life. Wano is your physical appearance. Sukham is happiness. And balang is energy. So I tell them that by giving me the gift of a ride or giving me a gift of food, it's the gift of energy and I get those four qualities. And I ask them, can you see how I get long life, good looks, uh, happiness and energy from your gift? And they, they nod their head and say yes. And, and I say, well, I get these qualities and you get them back. So always do everything with love and kindness because it will, get, it will come back to you. And then sometimes I say, don't do anything when you're angry. Don't send text messages. Don't send emails. Don't send, don't open up your mouth. Just, just stay quiet and don't do anything if you're angry. And, uh, and then I go and I, I chant the, um, the Pali afterwards. And I usually close my eyes when I, when I chant. And they sometimes close their eyes. And when I'm finished, they're sort of like doing a small little meditation. And it's really nice to, to open up my eyes and finish that chant and to see the person that I'm giving the blessing to have their eyes closed and soaking in what I, what I just chanted and what I just said. And a good portion of the time they say, you know, after they open up their eyes, they, they, say, they say, thank you. Like, like a really heartfelt, you know, oh, thank you. You know, they, they really, they really enjoy that. And that's, and that's what happened um, in that last, 
in our last interview when I talked about the people who, who donated the uh, KFC box, after I was finished, they were like, wow, thank you. And then they started giving me more food, which was what I needed actually. And um, uh, so it's, it's really nice. Sometimes people cry. Some, I've had people cry. I've counted seven people have cried in the past year uh, from my blessings. At one time I gave a blessing. Um, I was getting a ride home from one of my supporters, actually the supporters of whose house I'm staying in right now. It's, em it's empty, they're not there. And um, I was getting a ride home and they wanted to pick something up from someone who is moving. And in Kauai, there's a lot of spiritual uh, people who live on the island. And they said, they said, hey, we have a monk in the car. Do you want a blessing? Do you want a blessing for your move? And, uh, and they said, sure, I'd really love it. And so I came out and it was in the afternoon. And I said, well, normally people give uh, food and they get a blessing because they make their own blessing. And, and it was the afternoon. I said, well, you can't give me any food. So what I got to do is I got to give you a teaching. I'll give you a teaching on the loving kindness uh, the loving kindness sutta. And if you follow these teachings and you put them into action, you will make your own blessing. And so I, I gave a little translation of the um, Karaniya Metta Sutta. And then I chanted it. It takes a couple minutes to chant. It doesn't take long. And uh, when I was finished, she just started crying and crying, like, like strong crying, but happy crying. And uh, and then and then later she explained that um, the reason why she was crying was because it was something she had followed for a long time, maybe her whole life or whatever, and she's never heard anyone of of any authority reconfirm this belief, this natural belief that she had, and she was she was crying because of that. And uh, I tell you, it feels really good when someone cries. It really feels good. I mean, uh, you, you really feel like you touch someone uh, when that happens. And so I'll, I think after that happened, I, I went back to Uncle Gene and I told him the story. And, and he's, you know, really happy. And he says, wow, you know, I really understand what you're all about. And uh, so he was, he was quite happy about that too. So um, when people support the monk, they can support um, these kind of activities. It might, it might not happen every day, but it actually does, <laughs> it does sort of happen every day because I got to eat some, you know, I got to eat. And, and just about every day, I think maybe every day, um, I'm giving blessings, I'm doing, I'm receiving food, and, um, and I'm teaching in one form or another. And sometimes I believe that um, just by walking down the street, I can be a teacher. Just by not touching money and, and having a different life that is going in the opposite direction of the way society normally operates, that that is um, a teaching within itself. And a matter of fact, when the Bodhisattva um, when he finally saw the signs, old age, sickness, and death, the fourth sign for him to go forth was to see an ascetic. And when he saw that, he decided that he too would go forth into the life of homelessness. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I... Um... When I, you know, it's hard to explain to someone something where the value is more something you feel rather than the action itself. Like gratitude, you can't teach someone, you know, you can't tell somebody, you know, be grateful or appreciate. Because mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was at Pa'auk and a few times that I went for alms, 
Um, Pa'ak is a meditation center in Burma, just so people... Yeah, Pa'ak is, <laughs> yeah, right. The monastery where, where we met, you and I. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and there were a few times when I went to, actually with our mutual friend, uh, Abande Mukita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we were in a... Um, we went to... Where was it? We went outside of the monastery for alms. Yeah, you went to one of the villages. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember the difference that the difference basically going and receiving um, food from individuals rather than going to the cafeteria or not, not the cafeteria, what would they call it? The, um, the donation hall. Right, like the donation hall where the lay people just lined up and they just basically putting scoops of food into your bowl. Rather, you're walking right. and somebody runs out and offers you something or maybe invites you in um, and you're just going. And sometimes it takes an hour, two hours, and then, you know, you also have to be kind of careful with the timing. And then... Because you got to eat. Right, and you don't really know what someone's going to give you. So there's like that uncertainty and unpredictability and the somewhat of the pressure of the time. All of mm -hmm. that creates, I don't know, like for me, I thought it was like intensity. And then when, so when I see that food actually does make it into the bowl, and then mm -hmm. it's like this miracle. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Nobody had to do it. And I didn't deserve it either. Like I just walking. <laughs> so I don't feel like I did. I'm not doing anything. And someone's giving me like, so it, it really transformed my. Uh, You're trusting. Understanding of that experience. Because before just kind of like listening about it stories or it wasn't it didn't really have much meaning until i was there and then could actually it, i felt like it really changed my understanding of what it means to give because i was on the receiving end yeah <clears throat> i don't know I, I whenever i see people that are very generous like it's very humbling. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember um, about the time constraint. Uh, I remember once I was going to a university in Myanmar and one day the food was not allowable because one of the monks who used money was donating <laughs> food for the monastery or something like that. I forget what it was, or they were cooking. They were, they were cooking, they were involved in the cooking of the food and um and so i had to um oh no 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 it was something else it was something about uh uh the legal there was some legal problem with the with the rules i i don't want to say what it is and uh so i had a choice don't eat or maybe go to the village and so i went to the i decided to go to the village and uh you know, I went this place and this place and um, I, uh, I got some food, but it wasn't enough. But, you know, time was running out. And so I just went in, in front of the lake. There was like a little lake area and I sat on the steps and I started eating what I had. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't what I normally would eat, but it was, it, I guess it was enough. It was better than nothing. So I'm sitting on the, on the steps that go down to the lake or this pond area or whatever. And there's lots of little shops or something like that. And one lady sees me eating my food um, on the steps. And then all of a sudden, you know, a chair comes and they're, they're like saying, you know, Bante, sit in the chair. I'm like, okay. And I grab my bowl, I lift up my bowl and I'm starting, I'm sitting in the chair. I'm eating, you know, and I only had like 15 minutes to eat, you know, I, I, I had stopped, you know, just in enough time. And, uh, and so then, uh, then a table came. 
<laughs> then <laughs> this lady, she's ordering all this food, like a whole bunch of rice came, and then a bunch of curries came, <laughs> and then some cakes came. And I'm I'm like looking at you know at the time and trying to trying to eat, and it was just it was just really beautiful. And then um, uh, it was really nice. And then I was finished, and then they ate the leftover food. Um, and she was she was really really happy that she she made the um, she was able to make that merit. And uh, and I guess you know um, you know things always, everything always works out. And, uh, but sometimes when, when you go out and there's not enough time, I, I sometimes call it extreme sports bowling. <laughs> sports bowling? <laughs> extreme sports bowling. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, using your bowl and, um, you know, it, it's not like you're going to, you're going to die if you don't get food, but you know, you, you run out of time. You could run out of time. And, and so, uh, Sometimes I, I joke about that. Um, but there's also some, some aspect of, of newness and, and not having, a, as one of, one of my friends um, and I, used, we used to discuss, you know, when we, when we go out and we get alms food, it's not going to be anywhere near the quality of the food inside the monastery. It's 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 just not even going to be close to the quality. It's going to be it's going to be cold. It's going to be mixed. It's going to be mixed with everything else. And um, uh, but uh, but for some reason, you know, you feel better about it. Um, and and it's a it's not a sure thing. And and you're relying on people, and you become you become more um, grateful. When you, when you rely on people, of course, you become more grateful. Whereas, um, so there's a, actually a practice where some people go down a different road each time. And so that they, they don't come to expect to have the, the same donors again and again and again. And, uh, and that's, that's a very difficult practice. It's, it's one of the ascetic practices. and. Um, I remember one time early on, um, I think this was uh, one of my last, uh, my last month that I was at Pa'ak in my first round. So it was 2007. And I was going uh, down this, this path and I was, I was going down this village and uh, along the village was this uh, rubber tree plantation. It's no longer there anymore. I think that's where the military hospital is now. But there was these military, um, I'm sorry, there was these uh, rubber tree plantation people living in this, you know, grass hut. And uh, slowly but surely, uh, on my way to this village, I would walk through the forest to get there, and they would give me food along the way. And first it was, you know, a little bit of rice. The second day it was rice and one curry. Then the next day it was rice and two curries, rice and three curries. And, uh, and then they invited me to another house that was uh, another, you know, bamboo or grass hut. And, uh, and so I went to that other house. And before I knew it, I had more food than I could ever hope for from a village. And it was just coming from these two, um, these two uh, families that lived in the rubber tree forest. And so I wasn't going to the village anymore. I was just going to these two houses. And I remember um, I, used to, I used to go from one village to the next. I used to change every week. One week this village, one week another village, one week another village. And here it was, it was finally um, actually easy. I could, I could walk down into the forest for about 15 minutes. I could get a nice balanced meal and I could walk back. And it was really, it was really beautiful. And I remember asking one of my um, one of my friends, and I, I said, you know, is it okay to just keep going there? Because I felt sort of guilty, like I would be burdening them by going there every day. And he says, no, you can go 
for one year, two years, and he smiled and he was, he was, he was so, uh, he knew how it all worked. And I felt sort of like, why should I be, you know, burden people? And, uh, and I finally understand it now. And I don't, I don't know if I could do it in the West, but, um, but with the, with the Myanmar people, you could definitely do that. Eventually, um, around that time, I had to, my visa was rejected because uh, I had changed a tourist visa into a residential visa without going out of the country. And uh, the new, there was a new minister and he was, he was actually uh, catching this little trick that was done uh, seven, six or seven years ago. And um, so I, I, I had to go to either Thailand and come back or I, I decided to go to Sri Lanka instead one way. It was almost the same price back then. So same price to my donors, not to me. And uh, so um, I remember I told them that uh, I, was, I was no longer gonna go and it was my last day because they would, they would make curries for me very early in the morning. And um, these people were really poor. And uh, I went to the second house and I got the food. And then I went back, to, back on the path to go back home. And this lady had this bag and it, it looked like it had a bunch of um, tea mixes. You know those tea mix, like green tea mix? Yeah. It looked like there was a, a, of course, you know, if you go Pindapata, if you go for alms in Myanmar, you get tons of that. Yeah. So, uh, so inside the bag, it looked like green tea mixes or whatever. And I looked closer and, and it was money. And it was a, it was a stack of money. And uh, because they, they wanted to help buy my plane ticket. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I said, no, I can't accept it. And it, it really, it, it was really touching. Um, and, uh, and then I said, no, 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 I already have my ticket. And they said, they said, you know, they're, they're saying that, you know, they want to come with me and how will I get food and that they, they need to cook for me. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was really, it was really beautiful. And so um, th this covers a point of, of how people like to give and how, um, how, it, how it, even though I was going there for, I don't know, three weeks or four weeks, it was, um, it was still always, it was still always fresh and still, I was still very appreciative. And, um, and I remember I went to look for them when I came back six years later, but their their rubber tree forest was was gone, and uh, I think there's a military hospital there. And uh, but I felt I felt um, really good about that. Yeah, I'm glad you had the experience to go for alms. It's really yeah. good, and you can do it in America too. <laughs> it's a little harder, <laughs> but it's. <clears throat> but it's good. It's one of my goals or dreams one day to do that again. Well, Anytime, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for the interview. Um, I want to do another one soon. Um, okay. So, yeah, I look forward to talking to you more sure thank sure. you i always look forward to talking to you as well <laughs>